Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I am joined today by Pastor Ken Warline who just finished part one of the Surrender series. Thank you so much, Ken, for being here today. Now there were a ton of questions sent in, a ton of questions and a lot of emotions in those questions. Um, And so what I want to do is I want to read a statement that was sent in that I think encapsulates a lot of those emotions and I want to hear your response to this statement. So this is a statement that was sent in. The only way to achieve change is to stand up and band together as Christians, to show the world that we are not okay with the corrupt politicians that are destroying the core of this country. Laying down would only allow the godless liars and thieves who are now in office to strip Christianity out of every part of our lives. I wholeheartedly believe Jesus would want us to stand up and say enough is enough to try and save our country from ruins. Hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, instinctively, I, I I get this and could easily nod in approval to, to all of this. I mean, I grew up in a traditional uh, family, uh, rather conservative family, politically uh, not particularly involved, but at least interested and in, in active in, in you know, that sort of way. And so I get this sentiment. Uh, but when the, the writer says, uh, I, I firmly believe Jesus would say, stand up and say, you know, well, well, you're going to be hard pressed to find that Jesus in the Bible. Okay. Um, now, I get it. And, and if left to my own devices and, and just say, well, I'm, I'm not going to look at God's word, I could say, yeah, let's band together. But I think this is where we are going to have to, to submit ourselves to what does the Bible really say? What did Jesus really do? And, and here's what we're going to discover. And, and that is, uh, f- first of all, America, which I love, and we do the big Fourth of July and the fireworks and the red, white, and blue. I love that stuff. I grew that's again, that's I get that patriotism. I love it. Um, but I love Jesus more. And I think what we have to to remember, as followers of Jesus, we're part of a different kingdom. Uh, which doesn't negate the part that we, we're, we're still Americans right now, or if, if you're living in a different country, you're that country. And, but I think what helps us is to, what will help us is to realize, okay, these words that were written that I preached about today were written to Christians, millions of Christians throughout history who've lived in other parts of the world than just America, and just America at that, that only existed for 200 and something years, um, over here, because we get a very ethnocentric way of reading God's word right. through the through the red, white, and blue, to which Jesus says, "That's not. You can't start with the red, white, and blue. I'm writing this to Christians in China, to Christians in Nigeria, to Christians uh, in in all parts of the world. Now, this is what makes it very hard for us." Um, Americans right now who are Christians. Conveniently and gratefully, we'll take it as a gift from from the Lord. Much of American history, especially if you're Anglo uh, and male, um, for the last 200 years, Mm -hmm. has uh, dovetailed very conveniently with the Judeo-Christian outlook, values, ethos, um, morals. So it has been, for the better part of our history, uh, very easy to say, well, America is a Christian country. Uh, How do you get there? Well, because what America stands for is what the Christian moral stands for. They look very similar. And many people, unfortunately, have bought into the myth that America is thoroughly and always has been and always will be a Christian 
place. No, they dovetailed very nicely, but there were plenty of people who never were Christians, who were Americans, but they still did a lot of the same things that Christians did and didn't do a lot of the things that Christians didn't do. And therefore, they looked very similar. Now, those tectonic plates are shifting and the Christians are are grasping and panicking and saying, no, bring them back together, bring them back together. We need an American country again. I mean, a Christian, we need to be a Christian. Well, were we ever really? Some have argued, some scholars say, we probably don't have any less Christian, real Christians today in America than we did 50 and 100 years ago. But do you not feel the do you not feel that the Christian values are slipping away and do Americans not have a responsibility to try to shift those plates back together? Well, I, where they synchronize with God's word, sure. yes. Where they don't, no. Okay. Um, so I think going back to where we started, we have to, to frame this in a, in a greater worldwide context than just starting in and looking at the red, white, and blue and going from there and saying, this is what Jesus would, well, I think you're gonna have a hard time to actually prove that. Well, I, and I think what people might be afraid of is that the further the, the plates shift away from one another, the more the possibility of persecution and things like that that could arise from us becoming less and less of a, of a Christian nation um, so is that something that we shouldn't try to fight against or is that something we just embrace? Or? Yeah, well, so here's, here's, here's again where, where context is everything. We have to, to frame our existence right now in this country against a broader backdrop. Where was, who was Peter, what, what was the, the context that Christianity was born in? It was a violent, vile world and Christians were being fed to the lions and beheaded and, and, and burned and, right. you know, terrible things. And did they band together and say, you know, we're not going to take anyone. No, that's not what they did. Okay. Why? Because Peter advised them, instructed them the way that Jesus had always instructed his followers. Say, no, you're going to do the countercultural thing. You're going to band together, but you're going to be uh, uh, um, a community leading a revolution of love. Okay. But what if we get killed? Yeah, well, you'll be in heaven. Okay. And Christians are facing that right now in other parts of the sure. world. And please, Lord, that it doesn't come that way to America. It may. But the good thing, uh, the hopeful thing, I think, for us mm -hmm. is the realization that throughout history, Christianity never does better than when uh, persecution is greater. Okay. And conversely, real Christianity, not look-alike Christianity, right. never does worse than when there's, there's, there's no heat on the stove. Okay. And that, I'm afraid, is where America has been mm -hmm. in the recent decades. Um, so you'd say it almost made us complacent a little bit. It has. Yeah. And sort of, and, and therefore you have a lot of people who, um, you know, we're, I don't want to be persecuted. Let me be the first to say, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be beheaded or something for my faith. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't deny when you look at the history of the church, that how it began in those first several hundred years, what happened in China 60 or 70 or 80 years ago, um, whenever the the, the, the screws have been tightened up on Christians. Christianity spreads. It's contagious. Why? Because the Christians are different. Even to death, they, they're gracious, they're loving, they're forgiving, they're contagious. They're setting something out on the sample platter that the world says there is something altogether different about you. Right. Okay. And see, I'm afraid there's nothing altogether different about the, the writer thinking here. You just go, well, that's just, well, this is where I'm afraid it's not what Jesus would say. Right. So we need to zoom out past our purely American perspective, maybe even zoom out so far that we have more of an internal perspective. Exactly. Okay. 
so there was a there was another question that that was sent in um, that had to do with submission, um, and there was a person who wanted to know what you think the difference is between submitting to authority and respecting authority. And so the example that they gave was that they said that Jesus didn't submit himself to Pilate, but he respected Pilate's authority. And so I want to know what your response would be. Hear your yeah, thoughts on that. Parsing out the difference. Um, Right. So we respect the office, even though maybe we can't respect the officer sort of thing. Um, well, I would, you know, I guess we'd have to, to wrestle with this a moment. I think he did submit okay. himself because he ended up dead on a cross. Mm. Um, and so, so I think probably what we have to wrestle with is if if a person were to say you have to respect the 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 person the officer but you don't have to submit to them um th that is an oxymoron you, okay. you 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 can't that's i don't know how you do that now flip it christians throughout history right here in first peter right now in other parts of the world are and have been killed for their faith in Jesus. Do you think they respected the people that were beheading them or you know, shooting them or however it was? I don't imagine they respected them. No, I don't think so. But what they do, they did what Jesus did. They submitted sure. themselves to this. Sure. And so uh, if you are gonna uh, paint yourself into a corner and say, I'll only go with one. Well, you have to go with, I'm going to submit. Right. Yeah. So, so to respect without submission would be a paradox, yeah, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, and so there were quite a few questions sent in about uh, conscientious objectors, actually, whether to, sure. to war or, or maybe in civil disobedience or sure. things like that. And there are some issues which are pretty black and white. And so if the government were to come to us and say, you have to pray to Baal, that's pretty black and white. We would say, no, we cannot do that. Right, right. Um, but there are other issues that are more gray. When do I object to a war or submit myself um, or, or civil disobedience, for instance? Um, when do I know? Yeah. Uh, basically, the question is, how do I decide when is it appropriate to submit to authority and when is it appropriate not to submit to authority? Right. Okay. So... Uh, let's go back to sort of the the, uh, the point that I was trying to make in the message, and that is, uh, to quote James Montgomery Boyce, there, there are two authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the government and there's God. Okay. And as long as the government doesn't try to usurp God, we always yield to the government. Okay. If, though, the government comes along and s s moves into this position and says uh, 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 no, to something God has said yes to, or says yes to something God has said no to, you must, um, then that's the point at which we, you know, have to say, I, I can't do that. Okay. So you gave a good example. Uh, an easy one would be if the government says, you must pray to Baal, or to this person or that person, or we could easily say, I can't do that as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now you've brought up one, uh, Adam, that uh, is, is more difficult, mm -hmm. and that is uh, when you get into uh, conscientious objection, uh, pacifism, um, you know, uh, civil disobedience, right. some of these sorts of things. I think the question, behind the question is a deeper question. Okay. How much can I not submit to the government and not be in sin. Right, because it seems like a trap. Right. Sometimes if you submit to the government, you'd be breaking God's law, but if you sure. break God's law. Sure, so for example, you know. the, the soldier who is told, who's drafted and says, you, you, you know, we're going to fight those people. Right. And says, well, all right, I, it's not really my cup of tea, but if this is what we have to do, I'm submitting, I'm, you know. But you get into it and, and you as the soldier begin to realize, uh, wow, this is genocide. Mm -hmm. We're 
uh, exterminating all the Jewish people, you know, or some other such group, you know, whatever. Um, now, maybe at this point, I'm going to have to wrestle with this, and, which is clearly what Christians did right. in uh, World War II. In fact, you were telling me uh, before we started, to, to talk about the, the white, what was it called? The white, the white rose. Yeah. yeah, so the white rose, they were a group of um, college students that were predominantly Christian that um, opposed the war, opposed Germany um, and uh, all of their actions during World War II. And so one of the ways in which they objected was they um, wrote up these leaflets and they, on the leaflets they would list all the different ways that um, Germany was committing these different evil, horrible atrocities mm -hmm. and they would also break down how um, all the things that the German government was doing were went against the gospel of Jesus because yeah. the German government claimed that they were a Christian government sure. at the right. time. And so the whole, the whole point of this pamphlet was to try to wake up the people of Germany to show, hey, this war is not okay. Like what we're doing is evil. We are on the wrong side of this, yeah. of this battle. And so these college students, they would go in the middle of the night and they would disperse them all throughout Germany. Um, and eventually the allies found some of these pamphlets and ended up printing up thousands and thousands of copies and just dropped them all over Germany. Right. Now, many of the members of the White Rose were captured and some of them were um, killed uh, for acts of treason against the government. Others were free right, um, right after the right. Well, they surrendered. But. Yeah, so there's an interesting story of the way one group of people uh, dealt with it. I think probably it's impossible in a forum like this to just give a blanket, well, this is inbounds and that's out of bounds, and this is inbounds and that's inbounds, but that's too far, no, you can't do that. I think this is where um, we have to, to rely on several things. We have to rely on God's word, on our ability to talk and listen to God, and the, the benefit of the church, okay. the community of Christians that comes together and says, okay, I'm wrestling very, very much with this. I'm being told you must do this um, or you must never do this. And yet I see God's word is saying the opposite. Right. And I'm trying to figure out how do I, I don't want to sin against God and I don't want to be unsubmitted to the government. And how, how do I arrange this? And I think this is where serious Christians throughout history have had to come together and wrestle and pray and search God's word and have come out at different points mm. as well. Uh, let's be clear to say that as, as well. And so this is basically the, the question of how do I know personally when to submit and when not to submit is not a question you should be answering on your own. No. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I think some of them are easy. If they say sure. like the, the Baal one again, you right. have to worship this. Well, that's easy. You would, would, but, but on some of these other ones, they get much more complex. Right. Especially, we have to, yeah. we have to com uh, depend upon community. Uh, not just any community, but the Christians and the serious right. Christians who really love God and love God's word and, and want to do what his will is. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, so one last question. Um, this person wrote in, how and what can we do to transform our hearts to become more humble? And how can we gain more grace? Well, this goes back to the gospel, the good news. We have to re-gospel ourselves every single day. Right. And uh, what is the gospel? The good news that while we were rebels, while we were sinners, while we were sheep that had gone astray, he said, I'm coming after you. And when we began to realize I'm in a bad place and started devising our methods for working our way out of that pit and, and trying to, 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 to work our way back into a favorable position to, to, with God, he said, no, you can't do that. It will never work. I'm coming to get you. It's all about me and what I've done for you and what I'm doing for you and what I will do for you. And he sent Jesus and Jesus died on the cross and paid the price for our sins. And he says, so you just link yourself to me. And I think we have to just come back to that every single day. And as we do, our hearts melt. And where we were feeling like my son, a little bit better than them a little while ago, we begin to realize I'm not better. 
right. than them. Um, I might have different opinions. I might have a different approach, but I'm not better. I'm, I'm a gospel person. I'm a follower of Jesus, and my life is surrendered to him, and so I'm going to submit to the structures that he's put in place, and I'm going to bank on the uh, both his promise and the proof that history provides that going this countercultural route will, over the long haul, bear more fruit than if I say, to heck with this Bible stuff. I'm going to stand up and say, this is what Jesus, well, no, yeah. that's never what we found in, in God's Word. I think it's especially crucial with these issues of when or when not to submit to authority because, like you said, I mean, they, it can just cause all these emotions to build up into, in us and it can cause us to maybe act out of those emotions and reconnecting with Jesus helps us to prevent us from maybe um, doing something that Absolutely. we would want us to the, do. The more that I can allow my heart to be melted, right. the more I realize, okay, because uh, we so typically make it all about us. Mm. That's just human nature. And we're going to keep going with this. I mean, we're going to move into the, the message next week um, where we're talking about uh, our employers, our bosses, and uh, what then? Well, there's going to be some challenges um, and uh, so a couple of twists, and I'm going to share a story or two from my own life as, right. as well. So we're going to keep the conversation going because right. this is hard stuff. Now yes. we're into upper-level Christianity. Yes. This is beyond just get-her-started level Christianity. Right. Um, this is where the rubber meets the road. Nitty-gritty. Mm -hmm. I'm very much looking forward to part two next week. And thank you so much, Pastor Ken, for being here with us. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.